We, I know some of you arrived early because there was a miscommunication. The start time at 6 o'clock, however, the start time is 7, and we anticipate we'll be starting in about 10 minutes. So I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Check.
Well, it's 7.15, everyone. If we take our, if everyone will take their seats, we'll start. What a wonderful group. Good evening, everybody. We have a full house. This is fantastic. We really appreciate you coming out this evening. Good evening again. My name is Betty Hager Francis. I'm Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Health Human Services and Education for County Executive Rashern Baker. With us this evening, and Mr. Baker will be here in just a moment, with us this evening is Kevin, Dr. Kevin Maxwell, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Prince George's County Public Schools, and Curtis Valentine, who is a member of the Board of Education. We have our Chief Administrative Officer for Prince George's County, Nicholas Majette, Dr. Monica Golson, new Dr. Monica Golson, Chief Operating Officer for Prince George's County Public Schools, Terry Bacote Charles, who is our Budget Director for Prince George's County. We have Dr. Beatrice Tignor with us this evening. Many of you may know her for many years of service to Prince George's County. And do we have any other elected officials here with us this evening? Um, is, oh, oh, Mr. Burroughs, Edward Burroughs, member of the, of the Board of Education. We have Ms. Latrice Covington, who is the principal of Isaac Gordine Middle School. And Ms. Vita McCoy, who is the principal of Avalon Elementary. And I want to thank you all for coming here this evening uh, to join with us in this important conversation about right-sizing our county's investment for our children and our schools. I would like to thank our principal, Dr. Sandra Carr, and the entire staff of the, is it Tayak Elementary School? Tayak, sorry, Elementary School for hosting tonight's conversation and ask Dr. Carr to bring us greetings and uh, provide some brief remarks. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Welcome you to the home of the Eagles where we give wings to children's dreams. Uh, before we start this evening's activities, I wanted to recognize my staff members that are here. So if you're at TIAC staff member, please stand so I can recognize you. Please stay standing, I would appreciate it. I want to give you all just some history, brief history of the dedication that these folks have given to this school and our community and to our children. So for Mr. Wilson, who's not here, who is my PE teacher, 21 years in this building. Ms. Hussein, please raise your hand. This is her second year. Ms. Dargan, nine, 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 excuse me, her first year. Uh, Ms. Odonis, nine years. Ms. Exum, this is her first year here. Well, actually, this is her second year in the county. Ms. Bolton, who is getting ready to have a baby, but she has given five years to the school. Ms. Lucas is two. Ms. Blakey is five. Ms. Johnson, is this is her first year. Ms. Chandler, this is her second year here. Mr. Harmon, 12 years. Ms. Ndaka, two. Ms. Ryans, nine years. Mr. Graham, this is his first year. Ms. Jones, 12 years. Ms. Tate, raise your hand, Ms. Tate. Ms. Tate has been nominated um, Teacher of the Year for three years. <laughs> Ms. Martin, five years. Ms. Balduco, this is her first year. Mr. Young, 18 years. Raise your hand, Mr. Young. <laughs> Ms. Huggins, three years. Ms. Benedicto, 11 years. Ms. Blakey, Blakeney, uh, let me go back here. Ms. Blakeney, five five years, Ms. Blakey, 12 years, Ms. Washington, four, Ms. Barnes, this is her first month, first year rather, Ms. Windsor is 21 years, who is Ms. Windsor? This is our cafeteria manager. Um, 
Ms. Jenkins is 14 years, Ms. Curtis is 10 years. Is Ms. Curtis in the room? Ms. Curtis is also our PTO president. Ms. Carroll, I don't know if Ms. is Ms. Carroll in the room? Okay, Ms. Carroll actually retired from the county and came back and is still given to this school 15 years. Ms. Deese, 14 years. Mr. Isaac, my AP, 19 years. Did I forget anyone? Raise your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, this is Ms. Clayton, and she actually uh, works here with us as a substitute teacher. And how many years have you been doing that? 14 years. And I have been here for a total of 14 years. Thank you. I appreciate you all allowing us to host, so I want to thank Dr. Maxwell, uh, Mr. Baker, when he comes in, all our, our officials that are in the room. We truly appreciate you coming here and allowing us to shine some light and let everyone know the dedication that we have for our school and our children and our community. This evening, our superintendent will be having a discussion about the promise of 2020, and with that, there will be discussions around what does that mean. That also looks like the SAT, uh, ACT, and what we would like to have for our children. And the average, of, uh, average SAT and ACT scores will meet or exceed state averages. Graduation rate will be 90% of students will graduate on time. College and career readiness, 100% of graduates will meet the requirements to enter a two or four year college, a technical school, or the military, and or earn a license or certif certification enabling entry into the job market with six months of graduate, within six months of graduation. What does that mean for TIAC? For us, if this promise of 2020 occurs, that means that we will get additional resources that are needed. And those additional resources, one would be a TAG resource teacher, and you might say, what does that mean? We have students who test into TAG and they have an opportunity to exceed or work beyond the classroom curriculum. And Ms. Huggins, if you will stand again, I think she might have left the room. Ms. Huggins actually works with my TAG students, but she can own, she's also the media specialist. But we will have someone that's actually dedicated to working with those students. Also, we will get a full-time pre-K. I have now Head Start that is housed in my building, but a lot of those students come from all across the area, and those students have to return back to their area when it's time to enter into the kindergarten. We will have a dedicated pre-K program for this building. We have had it in the past, but with funding, we no longer have it here. It's housed at Rose Valley, and let me recognize the principal up at Rose Valley. This is uh, uh, Ms. Williams. And she has my students and her students, and that is a halftime program. And I can tell you that having a full-time pre-K program makes a big difference in how children succeed in the latter years in school. So I would greatly appreciate, and I actually have asked several times over, could I get the pre-K program back? And hopefully that will take place. Also, we will be receiving a digital literacy program. What does that mean? My students in third and fifth grade will receive iPads, which we do not have now. I'm still trying to get smart boards in all of my rooms, so we're working on that. But that would be, bring our children at a place where we, they can keep up with all the technology that is needed at this point. Our children do very well with, on the computer, and the, and the old way of doing things we want to get past that. We want children to have an opportunity to work with technology. And lastly, we will get the International Baccalaureate Program. What does that mean? Our children will be having an opportunity to, look, uh, to work with curriculum internationally, and also that would give them a global uh, opportunity to work out as they move forward into middle school and to high school. With that being said, I'm going to turn the mic back over to Ms. Francis, who will start, the, uh, start this discussion. Again, thank you so much for coming out this evening. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Carr. We appreciate your comments so much. So I'll be serving as your moderator this evening. And um, I, we'd like to keep the, the discussion going um, in an orderly fashion. So as you know, we have asked anybody who has questions to write your question or your comment um, on the, the, the cards that are being distributed at the front door or um, you can actually um, grab a card from here in the room. Um, and if you have any service requests or any other concerns or issues having to do with the county government, um, our 311 staff is also here to take your concerns and service requests. Um, so please be sure to, to get in touch with one of those ladies or gentlemen who's out, outside in the hall. In order to make our time together um, the most productive, good evening, Mr. Baker. <laughs> In order to make the, our time together um, the most productive, we are going to stay right until the end, until we've answered every single question that we get th this evening. So write them down, anything you have, write them down, and Mr. Baker has committed that we will stay until it's over. What we are going to do, <laughs> what, what we're going to do, though, is if we have um, uh, two cards that have the same type of question, we won't repeat it. Um, we'll, we'll do our best to, to weed those out. Um, and so we will be grouping the cards together. So if there's any time remaining after we have answered each and every question or comment, um, we will be able to open up the floor to a little bit of dialogue. Um, once again, that depends upon um, how long it takes to answer all the questions. Now, before we begin our discussion, I'd just like to give just a very brief background. And before I do that, I'd like to recognize a couple of people. Former council member Ingrid Turner has joined us. And also Kenneth Haynes, who is president of Prince George's County Educators Association. And of course, our county executive, Rashern Baker. In March of this year, County Executive Baker announced his 2016 budget proposal, which includes a dramatic increase in funding for Prince George's County Public Schools, which will be funded in part by an increase in property taxes. Want to say right out front that senior citizens and those with a lower income will not be affected by this tax, and we'll be discussing that in detail as the evening progresses. The proposed historic investment in our schools of over $130 million is intended to move our school system from consistently being 23rd out of 24 school systems in the state of Maryland to being in the top 10 by 2020. This rapid improvement of our school system will occur as a result of implementing the programs in the school system's brand new strategic plan. This tax increase is going to require some some sacrifice, some real sacrifice from all of us. An increase of 15 cents in the real property tax rate, an increase of 38 cents in the personal property tax rate, and a 4% increase in the telecommunications tax. But it's for our children, and our children are worth it. With that background, and unless Mr. Baker has something he'd like to add, um, let's start our conversation with our first question. How will a 15 cent increase improve parent involvement in their children's education? And when will parents and students be held accountable for their education? I'm so glad that the first question goes to Dr. Maxwell and uh, Mr. Valentine. You're on. How will that happen? I'll, I'll take, should I take that? How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Um, my name is Curtis Valentine. Um, I'm also 
I'm an at-large member of the Board of Education. I live about two miles from here, so it feels good to be home. Um, I'm also a parent of two children in our school system. Um, so I, this, this question comes uh, close to home for me. My children um, are seven and five. They attend John Hanson Montessori School, not far from here. Uh, I'm also uh, a former eighth grade uh, language arts teacher here in the county at Oxon Hill Middle School. Uh, so I do understand um, the relationship between a parent uh, and a teacher and how that relationship affects the achievement of a student. And lastly, I'm the chair of the Parent, Family, and Community Engagement Committee of our school board. So I think about parental engagement in this budget specifically. Uh, we put funding into this budget to add an additional 60 uh, parent uh, outreach uh, advisors. These folks are actually based in schools full time. Uh, many of them are, are bilingual. Uh, they are charged with creating that bridge between the parent, the school, and the greater community. Uh, they are reaching out to uh, private businesses, to religious institutions, different groups, organizing parents, trying to keep that level of transparency and inclusion uh, very high, particularly in schools where we have achievement uh, is, is, is on the rise, but not moving as fast as we would like it to be. Uh, in this budget, we're also uh, financing an ombudsman, um, a full-time position, uh, which is um, in its, in its, in its literally a parent advocate for the school system. Prince George's County, for many of you who, who may have noticed already, we're the 17th largest school system in America. Uh, there are over 15,000 school districts in the U.S. We're number 17. Uh, over 206, you know, 206 schools, 130,000 students, 9,000 teachers. Trying to navigate that is not easy, uh, and many parents in this room understand uh, how difficult that may be. Uh, at the same time, we want to make sure that, that that relationship between the parent and the school and the school system uh, is as fluid as possible because we understand if that's strong, then the achievement of their student is very strong. Uh, our system um, functions really well in spite of uh, a, not a lot of parental engagement, particularly in the areas and in, in, in sort of periods of time in our children's lives we need it the most, middle school and high school. Uh, at a middle elementary school, uh, like TIAC, you will have pretty good parental engagement. And you can see it in the test scores. Third grade, 80% of the students are, are, are reading on grade level, and in math, 85%. But as they get older, parental engagement kind of wanes. At the same time, we're seeing drop off uh, in achievement in particular groups. We also have, look demographically in our county, about 65% of our students actually grow up in single parent homes. And almost countywide, what 62% uh, of our students are, are on free and reduced lunch. All of that coming together, we understand the, uh, our demographic, but we also understand that we also have very high, high expectations for all our students, as the principal here does as well. And this budget creates an environment where we're funding we're putting funds in places and in schools, particularly where we're going to have, where we need the, the parental engagement the high, at the same time, creating school uh, supports so that we have a level of parental engagement that is high at all 206 of our schools. So uh, in the areas of parental engagement, to be particular, sort of the two areas with the ombudsman position we're funding, but also an additional 660 uh, community outreach advisors. Thank you so much. Education should increase by 130 million and not be a shell game. What assurance can you provide that current county educational funding would not be reduced or reallocated? That is a great question. So, what do we, Terry, you're here. Terry, come on up. This is Terry Charles. She's our budget director. Let's give Terry a round of applause. She's a little nervous. Help me out here. Come on, show her some love. So Terry, our budget. So the school system currently gets what we call maintenance of effort. How much have we reduced that, that amount we've given them? Uh, you know, it, would this take the place of any of that money we've given them last year? No, it will not. In fact, it can't per the requirement that allows us to be able to move forward on this proposal in the first place. You cannot, it's called, I mean, using fancy budget words, you can't supplant. If we supplant it, then we would be in violation of what the state law says. And in fact, our proposal actually has us making use of $5 million of our own 
county resources to also support this. Effort. So we're actually using five million of the dollar that's in the general fund for the county to send over to the school system. Correct. So how much of this new money from this tax is going to the school system? We have a hundred and five million coming from real property, just under eleven million from personal property tax, twelve million from the telecommunication tax, and then that five million is from our other side of our business. Very good, thank you. Let's give Ms. Charles a round of applause. Great job. So, one hundred one zero zero one hundred percent of this money from the tax must, by law, go to the school system. I cannot use it for the other side which is the general budget. Guess what our general budget is? The general side of the budget, when we present it to the council, has us letting go 110 actual individuals who pay taxes in this county and who have mortgages. 110 individuals will be fired from our government. Five days of furlough for all county employees. Every department of your government is cut by 5%. For the fifth year in a row, we're asking every department, Betty's department, so that her department where she has health, human services, family services, 5% cut. DPW, 5% cut. DPI, 5% cut. Environment, 5% cut. Everybody on the general side has been cut. We're not spending a dime more than we brought in. None of this money can help on the general side. All of the money raised from these taxes must, by law, go to the school, 100% of it. It is the only place we're investing. So these great police officers you see out here, our great firefighters back there, guess what? They had two classes that they want to increase the number of firefighters. They're getting one. Police officers had three classes. They're getting two. Everybody else is cut because we're going to deal with the structural deficit of the county. So we're not spending any more money. None of this can help us out on the general side. It all must go to education. That's where the investment is. Because you know why? Because the only way we're going to get more revenues in this county is by growing our tax base. And the only way we can grow our tax base is by increasing the value of properties and getting commercial development here. We can't get commercial development and be competitive because the first thing they look at is your reputation. So when people say, oh, Montgomery County, great place to live, they're not talking about crime statistics, not talking about health, not talking about how many shops there are, they're talking about their public education system. When they talk about, oh, Arlington's a great place to live, not talking about crime, not talking about health, not even talking about those shopping centers. They're talking about their public education system. So when we go to the shopping, what is that thing in Vegas we're going to where we try to beg people to come? ICSE. When we go to Vegas and try and beg shops to come here and we compete with the surrounding jurisdiction, we're competing with the reputation of their school system. If we want to attract more shops, attract more businesses, get the FBI, improve your education system. So all of it's going there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. <laughs> we were led to believe with the building of the casino at National Harbor that Prince George's County school funding issues would be alleviated. What happened and what is to prevent your coming back in another two years with another hike in taxes? Well, Carrie, could you come on back up? <laughs> Don't be nervous. Great crowd. Where is my casino money? Sir, your casino money will not come online until mid-year. We're in, to make it clear, we're in fiscal year FY15 right now. The budget before us is being proposed is fiscal FY16. We are more than a year away from that. Your first bit of money will not come until mid-year FY17. And again, it's mid-year, so you're not even looking at a full year impact when it comes out of the ground. So I don't have any money hidden in the back for the casinos. No, no you don't, but we're, we're looking forward to mid-year FY17 when it does start coming online. Okay, newsflash. MGM is not built. So therefore, since MGM is not out of the ground, it is not here, we don't have the revenues coming in. Will it bring in 140, I mean $41 million extra revenues 
coming into the county? We believe so. But as Terry said, that money won't come online until 2017. It will be built in 2016. Revenues start coming into late 2017. Full-fledged coming in 2018. So we cannot use that money because it's not here. Now you might ask, well, where's our money from those other five casinos? Because they not just, because Rashur and Baker told you, listen, you bring MGM, we're going to get extra money. So y'all hold me accountable to that. That guy ain't got your money yet. But what about those other five? Because everybody said, we build these casinos, we're going to have this money coming in. Guess what? That money is actually here. It comes through the state. So we get a portion along with, what, 24 other jurisdictions? We get a small portion from the state. And how much did the state hold back this year? 20-something million. 20-something million dollars. Because the governor said he doesn't have any money. Did we get $20 million from the state? No, they cut it. And they said, find it yourself. So we get money from the casinos, but we get it in proportion to every other jurisdiction. Now, you may want to say, well, aren't we Prince George's County the people who make sure those revenues go up in gaming? Yes. We are. In fact, and I've said this around the county, my good friend, the county, those of you who live in Anne Arundel County or have a business in Anne Arundel County, they're getting a tax cut. I think it's 3%. He's proposing a 3% tax cut. You know why he can do that? Because he's getting $32 million of your money that's going to the casino that's located there. Yes, you went and spent it, because most of it, they track it. Most of y'all went, most of us from Prince George's County went there. So he's taking that $32 million and he's giving his people a property tax cut. But he is not cutting the 66% that he's putting into, or 60% he's put into their schools, because we're supplanting it. You know why he gets the $32 million? Because the live is located in Arundel County. So when MGM is online, we get the $41 million. But until then, we get what the state decides to give us, and we have to do. Okay. And the state is cutting back. Okay. Next question. Next question. So it's wonderful to see everybody here this evening. This is a true, truly full house. Let me, say, let me just say this from the beginning. I know there's probably follow-up questions, but here's what we're going to do so we're fair to everybody. And, and if you've ever been to one of these forums, you'll know that I'm telling you the truth. We will read through all the questions. I promise you, if, if you want to go back and forth and, and, and banter, that's terrific. But at the end of it, I will read through all the questions. We'll give you answers. And I will stay here until the nice maintenance people kick us out. Okay? Betty. That there is an overflow room. And so if you get uncomfortable for any reason in this room, there's an overflow room, and this event is being streamed into that room. So you'll be able to see and hear everything. And it's cooler there. <laughs> okay, next question. What would it take to, along with pre-kindergarten, add phonics back into the curriculum as a class or part of the curriculum using the funding that is proposed? Because as we know, without phonic awareness, success in reading is difficult, and with, and with that, the success in all around academics is impacted. So, the, um, so we have rolled out in, the, in this plan literacy coaches for every uh, single school which will help with that. The first uh, rollout of those are gonna go into secondary schools as we focus on graduation rates and ninth grade promotion. So they're gonna go into middle schools and high school and then the second rollout will go into elementary schools. But every school will get a literacy coach uh, to work with both teachers and with students on uh, numeracy and language arts skills, including reading skills. Uh, the curriculum itself, we follow, the state establishes a state uh, set of state standards and then our county follows the standards that are set forth by the state. So we follow that. I'd say, you know, we were, we were in a place years and years ago where it was sort of all phonics and then it was no phonics and we're really more in a blended place right now where we do a little of everything. So, so um, I, I don't think you should be under the impression that there's none of that going on. But particularly in the budget, 
the literacy is going to go there. It's going to go into, in, in the literacy coaches, it's going to go into professional development for teachers. It's going to go into support for teachers. And, and that's primarily where we're going to hit it in the budget. Um, yeah. How much are we putting into, the, how much? Come on. Monica Golson. And you just graduated? Good afternoon. Dr. Good Golson. Evening. Just got her uh, just got uh, doctor's degree. Can we give her a round of applause? University. Thank you. Yes. This weekend. Great achievement. Thank you. We're very proud this of weekend. you. This weekend. $5.2 million um, is set aside for rigorous literacy instruction, um, and it's listed over on the chart um, that you see over here to the far left that's specific to literacy. And literacy is numeracy and Very good. Next question. My husband and I are looking to purchase a home in the next year or so as first-time home buyers. We are weighing looking for a home in Prince George's County or Charles County. What are the up and coming areas in Prince George's County? <laughs> and why should we consider staying in Prince George's County? You have our prime leader here. So there we go. I wanna, as soon as I pick an area, there's going to be a part of the county that's going to come after me. Um, but I would say this, Prince George's County really is the hottest area uh, in the Washington region, in the hottest area in the state. I mean, we really are. We're going to have about $6 billion worth of development that's going to happen in this county over the next four years, more than any other place in the state of Maryland at one time. I think we're going to get the FBI. I mean, it's, it's a tough road to hoe, but I think we're going to get the FBI located in Prince George's County. We've got location. If you look at what we've been able to do over the last four years, we reduced crime, overall crime, in Prince George's County by 36% over the last four years. One of the biggest drops anywhere in the United States of America. Yes, you did. That's a round of applause. In the second year of this administration, homicides dropped 33%. We're building a new regional medical center, $650 million regional medical center, and connecting all of our health care. So if you look at Largo, for instance, very hot area to buy in and to live in. If you look at the area down here in the southern part of the county, not only do you have National Harbor, MGM, which is going to take place, but that is going to be the outgrowth of all of these other side, side malls that are happening. Every place you look at, every part of the county, there's some great, Suitland is one of my favorites because my kids went to high school at Suitland. I see so much potential in there. It's where we're going to invest a lot of money. You've got the infrastructure there with the, with the uh, trains, with the metro. You also have federal enclaves already there. That's a hot area. You're next to D.C. We're going to invest in it. You know, every part of this county is booming. The only thing we need to do to just really take off and to keep you here, one, it's a better place than Charles County. Let me just say that. Because there's more things that are going to happen here. But two, we're going to make the improvements in our school system. Because what Charles County will tell you is, yeah, Prince George's County has got all this development going on, but we got a better school system. Not just one school, but several schools. What we're going to be able to do, especially with this investment, is every part of our school, every part of this 500 square mile, is going to have a quality school system that's going to bring it up. So you want to stay here. This is the place to be. Given this budget, how will you make sure that students with disabilities achieve better academic outcomes and make more successful transitions from school to work and college? I'll start. You can finish. So, so, um, so special education uh, is really important. We're starting with, we are closing down Kenmore Elementary School in the coming year and creating a new early childhood uh, center, so starting at the very beginning. We also have been working very closely with the state to make sure that we're monitoring very closely any concerns or issues that come up. You know, there's due process, there's all the legal structures in, in special education. We're doing some realignment in curriculum and instruction, teaching and learning in, in our uh, division. 
and we are uh, changing some of the oversight and how that works in central office for monitoring. We're not really doing any more of an infusion than is required for IEP services, than for you know growth in students and everything. It's not like you see a line item in here that says we've got a big infusion of special ed, but we're very focused on improving our outcomes in special education and making sure that we are uh, doing what we should be doing and following the processes and procedures that are laid out uh, by law and regulation. So that really falls under the area in our school improvement uh, plan, our strategic plan under organizational uh, efficiencies where we're working to improve. And I think uh, Dr. Golson will. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add that special education is immersed throughout the entire budget. So in, in terms of, for example, digital literacy, so even though it's targeted at grades three, five, and eight, students, every student at grade three will have opportunities in five and eight to experience the use of technology to accept, receive the content that our teachers are receiving. I'm sure you know our children get our um, iPads and phones and take off and teach us how to use it. So we're going to use that technology to help to meet the needs of all of our students, not just our special education students, our talented and gifted, as well as our students who are already on grade level and on target. And then I also want to add um, at the high school level we've also invested funds into college and career um, readiness so notice we say college and career ready we want to make sure all of our students are college ready because we do have students who decide um, their senior year that they want to go to college it happens and so we want to make sure that we provided them everything that they need at the high school level so that they can make that decision at the last minute they have all their courses that they need to take in order to get into a University of Maryland system or outside of the state of Maryland so that they're equipped to be able to compete in the competitive world. That includes our special education students as well. So in that college and career readiness, we have careers that our students are interested in. We provide them courses very similar to a college atmosphere where they get courses that are specifically aligned to that content area that they're interested in. And then they're able to, in many cases, we will pay for their coursework for certification so that they can graduate already with their certification in a trade area. Thank you. I'd like to recognize that we've been joined by our Chief of Staff, Glenda Wilson. So, uh, and Mr. Valentine. I, I wanted to add something. And you, um, when I asked you about where they should live in the county, you gave their county executive. I'm going to give my Fort Washington answer. Um, there's a couple of reasons why you should stay in Fort Washington, Oxon Hill. Uh, one of them is Principal Ray Adams. Can you please stand up? Principal Adams of Friendly High School. Give him a round of applause. Uh, and he Get some of his administrators here as well. Any administrators from Friendly High School, please stand up. I see the brother here, young brother from, uh, from the high school. Um, I live in Fort Washington. My children go to school in Fort Washington. Um, and I'm going to be here until they graduate from either Friendly or Oxon Hill High School for different reasons. Uh, there's a lot happening here within our school system in this part of the county as well. Uh, if you have not been to Oxon Hill High School, please uh, take a tour. Uh, go see Principal Cadet. Um, see the great things that are happening in one of our three science and tech high schools. Uh, they actually have a 3D printer that allows students to print parts for engines that they're actually using to, to, to measure the pH in the Potomac River. Uh, we have Oxon Hill Middle School that actually is going to be turned into a science and tech middle school that's going to feed kids into the science and tech high school. If you have not been down to Oxon Hill Middle School and seen Principal Coleman and the culture change that's been happening there and how they're reading, they're, they're actually... Uh, won a, a countywide uh, uh, competition uh, not long ago. Uh, Isaac Gordine, Friendly High School. I was at Friendly High School for a day. I was principal for a day there and seeing all the great things happening in health science uh, at Friendly High School. Uh, even here at, at, at TIAC, where you have 80, 85% of the students are doing, doing well on, on math and reading um, at, at a very young age. But also our, our neighborhood schools are also doing excellent, Fort Foot Elementary, where actually every student in the school is learning Italian. Every student, no matter what. There are tremendous things happening in our school system in this part of the county, and whoever asked that question, I ask you to come talk to me, because I think Fort Washington and Oxon Hill in this area is the place to be. Thanks. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to recognize uh, DeMarco Clark, who is the principal of Thurgood Marshall Middle School. 
And, and I have to comment, you must be very popular with your colleagues. This is the first time we've had this many principals at one of our conversations. That's wonderful. Betty, I know that you said this before, but we really should say this is the biggest it audience is. we've had in how many we've done? Five this of these? is the sixth one. Six this one. is the last one. This is the last one, the biggest, but you know, and that means a lot because a lot of times, especially during the budget process, we don't get community engagement. So when we started to do this, to have these dialogues, we weren't sure people would show up. And, we, and, and it means a lot, one way or the other, that we hear from you and you engage, but you should give yourselves a round of applause for doing it. Well, well, I see uh, Sandra Bobo from Surrattsville High School. Can you please stand up as well? We see you back there. <laughs> So Rasville High School, another reason to stay in the south part of the county. A wonderful team in the south part of the county. So this is a long comment, but it addresses an issue that I know a lot of people have. So just bear, bear with us. Instead of the property tax proposal, why don't you impose fines or fees for people not taking care of their property by cutting the grass and picking up trash on uh, lots and grassy areas? Uh, Prince George's County is one of the highest taxed areas in the state, but services are lacking in quality of life issues and no adequate economic growth to employ the young people after college. Homeowners that have been in the county for 25 years or more have done their share to move forward. You are an example of just that with your achievements. To ask people to do more that are at or reaching retirement age is a hardship. No, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very good question, and, and it's, it's a tough one. Um, one, because you're absolutely right. Um, the people of Prince George's County pay a lot. We really do. Um, the, the, let me just address the first part of it. We looked at fees, uh, and we're, we're doing some of that. But the money you would get from fees would, would not raise nearly enough to invest in our school system. But we are doing that. Um, we looked at, and you talk about the other quality of life issues. If you've looked at, if you look at what we've done in this administration over the last four years, whether it's our Transforming uh, Neighborhoods Initiative, where we looked at the six, uh, six high needs areas of the county and tried to and focus on those areas for health disparity, job opportunities, employment, we're doing all of those things with a limited amount of budget. I wouldn't dare ask you for one dime more for the general side of the budget. Do we need more people who can go out and cite these violations around the county? Yes, we do. If you had Gary uh, Cunningham in here or Haitham Ajayzi, they'd tell you they need more people to go out. Do we need more firefighters? Yes, we do. Do we need more police officers? Yes, we do. Do we need more crews that can clean up our roads out here? Yes, we do. Did we spend a lot of money on snow removal? Yes, we did. But guess what? We're not raising a dime to deal with those because you pay enough. The money that we put in the education system, if you look at what we invest, here's the problem we're running into. It wasn't my idea. People think, oh, it's the Rashawn Baker bill that got around whatever, I'll get a question on trim later. <laughs> They're like, oh, you did an end run around trim. I ain't that smart. I really ain't. Wasn't even aware of it. You know, seriously, wasn't even aware of it. The end run was down by the legislature. You know why? And here's why. I'll explain it to you. So the legislature, which has been giving us 55% of our money for our school system comes from the state of Maryland. 55%, and I don't know what the new figure is, but I'm going to go with this one, 55%. 35% comes from us, from our tax dollars, even though it's 60% of our budget, which was fine when the economy was well. The legislature, i.e. Montgomery County, which put 66% of its taxpayers' money into its budget and only gets 27% from the state. The Maryland, i.e. Howard County, puts 69% of its taxpayers' money into its school system and gets 28% from the state, i.e. Calvert County, which puts 58% of its taxpayers' money into its school system and gets 40% back, 
Guess what? When the market changed, they got tired. Not just of Prince George's County, but every county that had a tax cap. Because like every county, I would go down there and say, I'd love to put more money into our school system, but I can't. By law, I can't raise the taxes. That worked for a little while, the first two years of my administration. Then the state, i.e. Howard County, Anne Arundel County, Calvert County said enough of that. Because guess what? The money they're sending us from the state is coming out of their pockets. And they said, you know what? Prince George's County, if you want to put more in your school system, then you do it. We're not doing it anymore. They're the ones who changed the law. And they allowed it only for education. But they also put a requirement on there. If we raise the revenues, we must report back on how we spent it. Because they want, just like you, they don't want us coming in and say, well, we raised the revenue, but we really needed to use that money to do something. I needed to get more police officers. Nope, can't do that. So we've got to report back. But they're the ones that said, you must now start putting money into your school system if you want to rise it up. That's why we're allowed to do it. It's because they got tired of putting it in. And they showed us again this year. If I didn't get it before from them, I got it this year. Because this year they said, not only are we not giving you more money, we're going to cut what we were giving you. So we're going to take $20 million and take it off the top. Now the governor can put it in there, but how many people think the governor is going to put the money in there and we're going to get it? Because if you, if you know something I don't know, please let me know, because I'm looking for help. So people will ask me, like, is there anything else? Yes, there is another way to fund this. I could fire half of the fire department. I could fire half of the police department. I could fire half of the rest of the government in order to get the money and fund our school system. That is the only other way. I am not allowed by law to do anything else. I can only raise the revenues that the state allows me to raise. That's it. I can't print money, they'll put me in jail. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Baker. What plans are there to be more inclusive for Native American education in Prince George's County Public Schools? Native Americans. So, so um, I think, you know, in a number of ways, first of all, you know, we've been trying, uh, as the state has been, to be very inclusive in our representation in our curriculum and our textbooks. And I think that's the primary way uh, that, we, that we do that. So I think, you know, that's really the, the best answer I, I can give. We don't have a specific targeted slice, but we do in our textbooks. I mean, even the new cover of our new, uh, new uh, Spanish textbooks have students of uh, Prince George's County actually represented on the covers to try to make sure that we're including our own students. But we, we uh, you know, we try to make sure that in both our um, our middle school language and culture class, where we're touching on a lot of cultures, and our literature, we're trying to make sure that we're broadening the amount of uh, reading that kids are doing about uh, peoples from around uh, our country and around the world. So, you know, we're trying to to infuse that in into uh, the curriculum, and uh, and I think that's a great question. And I'll go back and ask my teaching and learning folks to give me some examples of where, where exactly we have that. Thank you. What actions are being taken to upgrade and renovate the schools in South Prince George's County to compete with Montgomery and Fairfax counties? So, so I'll, I can let the county answer some of that if they want to, but let me just say that this is the operating budget. It, it, it has some money in it to improve maintenance because maintaining what we have is really important because we have such a big deficit on the capital side as well. So it's not just South County, but it's the entire county that we, we look at with a capital budget. Oxon Hill is in the south part of the county. Last time I looked, it's uh, a very brand new high school. It's, it's beautiful and, and there. We have a plan that we're required to submit to the state, a six-year plan that says here's next year and here's the next uh, you know, years out and what our intentions are so that they can also plan going forward. But this district over years has built up a deficit in the capital expenditure needs in the billions with a B of dollars, billions, because we have been underfunding the needs for our facilities in this district. 
we can only, as Mr. Baker just said himself on the county side, we can only spend what we can get. And at the rate that we're investing in the capital infrastructure of this district, we're not going to do the repairs, the replacements, the maintenance, um, renovations, and, and replacement buildings that we need in this district and anybody's lifetime in this room, whoever the youngest person is in here might be sitting in the front row. But at the rate we're investing, so, so we have to at some point talk about capital. I know that I was at the state legislature last year with Mr. Baker and with the county executives and the superintendents and board uh, leadership from Montgomery County and Baltimore County, asking them to change the formula that we would increase our investment if they would increase their investment. Uh, but right now it's sort of driven by this matching formula that the state has. And so, you know, we, we've got to be able to come up with more resources on the capital side. We clearly have a need. I mean, I've got, I can rattle off schools, but I won't because there's just so many of them that really need, you know, some significant work done. But without an expansion on the capital side of the budget, we're not going to get that done. And it's a big, big cost. Right. It, it funny, at least coming from me tonight, is that there was a bill in Annapolis uh, to raise the sales tax just for Prince George's County to go toward operation and construction of uh, capital projects in the county for schools. I actually went down and said, we don't want to do that. And the reason is this, we don't need to raise the sales tax for the capital side. Prince George's County, because there's one, there, those are one-time expenditures, capital projects, you spend it once. They're not the ongoing operating of schools. But we're prepared to put our, we set aside money to do the building in Prince George's County. So we went to the state and we said, listen, I, you know, I, I love Baltimore City. It's a great place. I'm not mad at them, but you gave them a great deal to build schools in Baltimore City. I'm just asking for the same deal. Give us a two-to-one match. We got $2 to your one. That's not, you don't have to raise taxes for it. We've got it available. Let's, you match us, because part of building the schools is a state function. You don't need to raise our taxes just because it would have been solely on Prince George's County. That's unnecessary. You do your part at the state. You give us that money. And the same thing Baltimore, I mean, Baltimore County asked and Montgomery County asked. Us, we in Prince George's County have the highest number of schools that are 40 and 50 years old. We were in one earlier uh, yesterday, Oakland Elementary School in the northern part of the county. So we're prepared to do that. What we need is for our state legislators and the state and the governor to say, listen, we're prepared to use our bonding authority. We've got the money set aside. We need the state's match. That's where we're going to beat up on the state and say, listen, you got to step in on that one. The operating, we get it. You give us operating money. But we want the one time to build a school so we can have not just Oxon Hill High School, that Potomac High School and High Point High School and all of these places, uh, uh, Fairmont Heights. So we're doing our part on that. We just have to push on the state uh, to do it. The only part of this budget that will help alleviate some of the issue is the ongoing repairs. So having enough people who are going to be um, on staff so that we can do that. You want to speak to that one? I think it's working now. So we've set aside $3.2 million um, to invest back into our schools to create a second shift. And that would be workers who would come into our schools and work the minute that school ends. So right now, unfortunately, we can't make any, a lot of those major repairs during the school day because our students and teachers are in the building. But the minute that they leave, we then will bring in an evening shift that will work until 11 o'clock at night to make those repairs so that when our teachers and students return the next day, what they placed in our electronic repair system has been repaired over the night and they can come back to a well-equipped classroom the next school day. That's great. What metrics will be in place to measure the effectiveness of whatever the increase is that's approved? So the, the strategic plan uh, lays out uh, the, the, uh, the assessments that we're going to be using as a school district in elementary school. It's the, uh, the kindergarten readiness assessment. It's the park assessments. Uh, in middle school, it's the park assessments. And the uh, ready step, ready step is... Um, the early part of PSAT and SAT, everybody's pretty pretty familiar with the College Board. They have a new uh, Ready Step program that the College Board puts out in, for eighth and ninth grade, which will give us 
you know, sort of earlier indicators on what we need to do with our children to get them ready for the PSAT and the SAT. And then in uh, high school, it is going to be the park assessments. It's going to be ninth grade promotion rates, graduation rates. It's going to be uh, enrollment in AP, uh, advanced placement, and international baccalaureate. It's going to be certificates and licenses. So like we have uh, IT programs where our kids can get a Cisco uh, certification and come out and work in those. We have a fire academy in collaboration with the fire department uh, where we have kids who um, you know, go across the street from Flowers High School to the fire department and work with the fire department training staff uh, to become equipped to join the fire department when they graduate. We also have some dual enrollment and we're gonna count that in our assessment. So we have students who take college classes at the community college. Uh, in fact, next week we have our first graduating uh, class for the Health Sciences Academy. They will receive their high school diploma. I think there's 40 of them. They're gonna receive their high school diploma one morning next week, and that evening, I'll be attending along with a number of other folks, their college graduation from the community college where in the same day as they get their high school diploma, they will get an associate's degree at our expense, two free years of college, the parents didn't have to pay. Just to, uh, just to add what Dr. Max will say, so in this budget, the additional money that he's getting for the 130 or $133 million that's coming to the school system has been delineated by line items. It will not all be spent in the first year. So each year there is a segment in, in those categories that we'll be able to measure. So we'll see the progress after the first year expenditure. We'll be able to measure whether those programs are working, which one are effective, which one maybe we should put some more money into, which one we should move around. But it won't be $133 million spent on J July 1st or wherever, when does the budget go in? July, uh, July 1st, I was right. It will be, it will be able to measure the progress over the next five years. So we can look at it, measure how effectively we're working, how the progress is going, so we can look at the graduation rates, we can look at our kids who are coming in these academies for the Spanish Immersion Program or the Mandarin Program in the North. Um, so we'll be able to measure it each year and Here's the other thing. We've got to give a report on all of that money to the state. Every year, we've got to let them know what the progress is. The way you'll be able to check it is on your tax bill, we're going to tell you what money is spent on education. So just in case by some thing that happens and you say, well, I don't really believe that that guy, Sherm Baker, really spent that money on education. You know, he was just saying that. Because, you know, politicians say that all the time. I know what y'all thinking. My wife's thinking the same thing. She's like, no, no, I trust but verify, honey. Well, on your tax bill, you will be able to see it. So we'll give a report to the state, but also at the county executive level. Betty and her team will be monitoring how we're doing. The county council, believe me, they'll be monitoring how we're doing. The school board, right, Curtis, will be looking to make sure. So every single year, we'll be able to tell whether we're making progress and whether this money's making a difference. So two, and two more quick points. One, if you go to our website, uh, I think the, the uh, if I remember it right, it's www.pgcps.org slash promise. You can see for every single school in Prince George's County what this uh, investment in public education goes to. So uh, Principal Carr, Dr. Carr here uh, mentioned a few things. So. Uh, they will get additional school-based budgeting funds in the amount of $63,351 here to support the work here uh, at the elementary school. They'll get uh, some additional, she talked about digital literacy, it's almost $30,000. School-based professional development, $26,346. Additional uh, breakfast uh, funds to feed children breakfast. 8,548, a tag, a gifted resource teacher, I said full day K, and, um, and they're also gonna start a career academy here on International Baccalaureate Primary Years uh, program for elementary school. So that kind of information is available on the website for every one of our, of our over 200 schools. There's also um, a PowerPoint from February 23rd, I think, that's on our website that outlines not just these categories, but every single one of the categories that we have uh, in the 
in the budget request uh, that this covers. Um, we have quite a number of questions here. Um, so if anybody, at 7.30, we're going to have to stop taking questions. So we'll be sure. Eight, oh, it's 8. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's 8.30? Eight okay, so yeah. we have, we probably have 20 or 30 questions more. Yeah. So the time for questions uh, submission, um, right. I think that we have to cut, cut Right, that, that way, at, we want to leave enough time for those of you who want to actually ask verbal questions. I'll stay around and go back and forth. But that way we get everybody's question that you've written down, we'll get those read, and then we'll leave enough time so that we can go back and forth. Sound fair? All right. All right, Betty. Okay. Read. As part of the investing in our schools plan, will there be a focus on providing healthier, fresher school breakfast and lunch options? These options would include choices such as a salad bar or taco bar or smoothie bar. Will there be or will there be a focus to eliminate items that contain unhealthy ingredients, such as high fructose corn syrup? So I'm not sure if one of my staff didn't just write that question, but, but um, the, the um, so look, breakfast is really important. And, and let me first say as a backdrop, we're required to follow the federal guidelines. The federal government reimburses us a certain amount for the meals that we serve. And so we follow every guideline that the federal government has. Now we can go beyond that, although I will say up front, all of it costs money. But we are looking at things that I've, you know, been, you know, aware of in the past. I mean, I, I have, uh, you know, worked in school districts where we expanded our healthy choices to, to uh, unlimited uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. We're not there yet in Prince George's County, but we are having those conversations. We're doing a lot of work with the Share Our Strength people out of the state of Maryland. But I will say that the additional breakfast money that I just mentioned when I talked about this school, we, we have, and you heard earlier, the poverty rates in our district. And we were not even feeding 70% of the eligible children, right? We have about two-thirds of our kids who are on free and reduced meals in our school district, and not even 70% of those were eating breakfast when I got here last year. So we've been expanding our breakfast programs across this county every single month since I got here last year. We opened five new Maryland Meals for Achievement schools the day after spring break for the fourth quarter. It takes a little time to roll them out. There are some issues with storage, with staffing. You know, we've been working with uh, Dr. Golson here and, and her uh, staff about making sure that we have, because it takes additional cafeteria workers. But, but, but we, we just can't afford, in my view, uh, to, to allow kids to come to school and not have the nourishment that they need. Because if they haven't had the breakfast that they need and that they deserve, then by mid-morning, they're no longer thinking about language arts or, or reading or math or social studies, science. They're thinking about lunch. They're thinking about their stomachs. You know, this is the wealthiest country in the world, and I just think it's a shame that we have hungry children who come to school in the morning. I just want to add one thing. Uh, the key word is there is choice, right? So my children are seven and five, and they go into a cafeteria, and you're going to give them a choice between vegetables and maybe not so much. <laughs> so guess where that love of vegetables and fruit starts? It starts at home. My children get fruit every morning. They get vegetables every evening. So we, get, we talk about parental engagement. I'm, I talk about parental responsibility as well. And the idea that we're creating these, this, this love of healthy foods at home so that when you give them a school, they actually make the right choice when it's put in front of them. I often, I'm in schools all the time. Again, I mentioned I was at Friendly High School, um, Principal Four Day, and I'm in elementary schools and middle schools. And when I'm in school, I eat lunch with the students. And the amount of food that our students throw away, healthy food, that they throw away with the garbage can, would make someone want to get angry. When I finished college, I went off to the Peace Corps and lived in South Africa for two and a half years in a little hut with no electricity and no running water. People ate one meal, maybe two meals a day, lucky. And I'm sitting there watching students throw food. Many of us who are advocating for this, these healthy food and these, these, these healthy options, but children are not eating fruit and vegetables at home, and we can't expect them to come to school, and all of a sudden they say, I want to try to eat a, a pineapple. I've never seen a pineapple before. Or I only eat them out of a can. So I think 
we talk about we're investing in our school system, but we want to make sure that we're also creating uh, positive role models at home so that when we do give them options, they make those options, they, they make the right choice. Uh, we also want to say recognize Delegate Angela Angel um, from the 25th District who's here tonight, great, a great parent and a great uh, member of our delegation as well. Um, but I just want to say, as we think about parental engagement, and this is something, uh, I'm a parent, uh, a former educator, and on the school board, so I see all three parts of this. Uh, but I understand that if I'm not giving my children those healthy options at home, that when they go to school, it may not matter as much because they're not going to choose them anyway. So I think that's, it, it begins with parental engagement, but it's also our responsibility as a school system to make those choices and make sure they're in, in, in the cafeteria. So I think it's both, both our responsibilities. Next question. Will the funds be used to create charter schools like they have in D.C., Washington, D.C.? Well, uh, I mean, uh, I used to, before I joined the school board, I ran a nonprofit here in Maryland uh, that really advocated for charter schools, for expansion of charter schools. And I was not always on the same side as Dr. Maxwell uh, on this issue. Um, and people, you know, uh, may not know that. Uh, Maryland's charter law, depending on who you ask, could be the best in the country or the worst in the country. Um, but what we have in our school system, Prince George's County, is a, is a, is a partnership where our charter schools are part of our school system. They're not private options. Uh, every public school student has access to that, particularly on, on, a, uh, on a lottery basis, but everyone has access to that. All the teachers who teach in our charter schools are all members of the, our collective bargaining. Um, they all take the same examinations, they're held to the same standards, and they graduate with the same diploma. Uh, so our charter school system is nothing like Washington, D.C. There are some folks who would like it to be like Washington, D.C., and some of them like it just the way it is here. Uh, our charter schools uh, do excellently with our students, uh, many of them, and, and we actually, every two or three, three or five years, they have to come back to us and actually be re, uh, recertified. Uh, unlike some schools, um, they have to come back, and if you, if you watch a school board meeting, you've heard me and my colleagues say, how are they doing on, on serving certain students? How well are they doing in making sure that they're, 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 they're raising expectations? for our students, so uh, this money is going to serve all of our students um, and ensure that we have uh, strong options and choices for all our parents, thanks. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Dr. Maria Smith, who is Instructional Director for Cluster 9. Uh, can we make the class sizes smaller? So. So that's, part, that's partly what the increase in the school-based budgeting is about. And the, um, you know, because schools have the ability to make some decisions about their staffing. So they already get, a, a, they already get some, and this increase, that's $63,000, I think, is almost a whole new, another teacher if they wish. They get a basic staffing allowance uh, through, through central office that goes up or down based on their enrollment. And then that additional school-based budgeting money is for them to make a decision about whether they want to have an art teacher, whether they want to have another classroom teacher. You know, those are school-based decisions. So the short answer is yes. As our enrollment grows, I think everybody maybe not be, may not be aware, but uh, prior to last year, we had declined in enrollment in our school system uh, for nine consecutive years. And in the last 20 months, last year and, and this part of this year, uh, this year, this school year, we've grown 3,600 students. And so as our enrollment grows, staffing does too. And I would just say this, as I visited every single one of the schools in this county last year, which, which took a little bit of time, I saw what I think the question gets to, which is there are class sizes that are simply too high. I'll give you an example. I went into high school advanced placement English classes in, in, in several schools. But in one particular school, there were a couple of AP English teachers and they were carrying one or two or three classes that had 42 and 43 kids in them. And you cannot expect our teachers with that kind of workload to really give the students the attention they need, to give them the writing that they need, the reading that they need, and, and, and do that. And so, you know, we, we're working to do that, but just like everything else, adding teachers costs money and staffing schools costs money. Over 85, I think it's about 87% of our budget goes to, to paying staff. So, so it's, a, it's an expense, and everybody just needs to, you know, all the things that people ask, and I get those kind of questions a lot, it takes money to hire new teachers. So, Dr. Maxwell, last year 
And in the past, I experienced the worst in Prince George's County Public Schools. This year, I have a compliment. Great change at Avalon Elementary School. It has greatly improved to become a student-centered, family-welcomed educational environment. The leadership is truly on the right track. Thank you. We're, we're working to have it that way at every single school in the district, working hard. How are our students expected to compete with other counties, states, and nations if we and they are not provided the resources, equipment, technology, et cetera, of other school districts? I got that. You're absolutely correct, whoever wrote that question. That's why we're gonna provide our children, our teachers, with the resources they need to compete in the Washington region and globally. And, Thank you. And, and let me just add, let me, let, me just, let me just add, when you look at the comparisons, if you look at the Washington Area Boards of Education, for example, or the Fordham Institute study on school funding that was put out last fall, we're funding our children at about $2,500 per child less in Prince George's County than neighboring Montgomery, for example. And it's similar for Fairfax and other regions here. And, and I just, you know, that's part of what this is, is designed to address here. Our children are held to the same standards, held accountable for the same things, and we are not providing the same level of resources to help them meet those expectations. The children in Prince George's County are absolutely worth as much as the children in Bethesda, Rockville, Columbia, St. Michael's, Ocean City, right? Our teachers work just as hard, have just as many demands, and should be paid comparably to the teachers in the other large districts in this region. It's absolutely impossible. When our teachers have worked here for seven or eight years, depending on the salary lane that they're on, whether they have a master's degree, whether they have a bachelor's plus 30, a master's plus 30, a PhD, they're, work, they're making anywhere from ten dollars to $15,000 a year less than teachers are making right next door in Montgomery County. Since the 2007-2008 since the school year, we, have, we only have 9,600 teachers there. I say only. I mean, we're a really big district. But we have 9,600 teachers. We've hired 7,100 teachers since the 7-8 school year. The amount of turnover in this district, we have people hired from this district like my wife did, like I'm going to. But, but we have a lot of teachers who aren't going to put up with the class sizes. They're not going to put up with the salary differential. And we need to help support them. And our principals have the same issue. They have the absolute same issue. And if we want to have a stable teaching environment, we want to have stable schools that are constantly improving, you can't have constant turnover in the schools and start over. We need to provide the mentor teachers that are in this budget. We need to provide uh, the teacher consultants under the peer assistance and review program, which are going to help our new teachers. You know, and, and again, because part of it's working conditions with the class size of things, part of it is the amount of support that they get, and part of it is the salary. We're just not as competitive as we need to be with the large districts. When and how will the teacher's $15,000 pay increase be phased in? What percentage of the increased funding will make it into the classroom versus administrative salaries? So, so, uh, so again, the administrative salaries, I mean, I include principals and assistant principals and stuff in there, and I don't have a, a breakdown. So let me just say, I think the total is 20, 20, 21, 21 .3 million dollars is to retain uh, our outstanding educators. And I will just say, and then I'll let Dr. It's so great to say that, Dr. Golson. Uh, no, it's important. You know, it's important. You know, you gotta, you, know, you gotta, you gotta enjoy it. it you know. Because I'm a product of Prince George's so, County Public Schools. So, Yay. and I am too, Bladesburg High School. So, so Ken Answer the Teachers Association is here, and by law, we negotiate with our with our bargaining unit. So we have to sit down. You know, if you know, depending on the appropriation of monies and things, and we have to sit down with our teachers association. And we have to sit down with our administrators uh, association, and we have to work through those details, you know, and that, that's just the law. But every, every bit of that money is going to go 
into educators. I just want to clarify, the 15,000 that the person might have referenced is for national board certification teachers. So if you become nationally board certified right. and you go into our schools that um, we consider low performing, then you get that additional $15,000 stipend. So I just wanted to clarify. And so, and so that has to be agreed upon, and, and I'm sure it will be. I'm sure they're, they're not going to disagree with that. But, but I would say that national board certified teachers, that's the highest certification the best, that exists. The best, the best of the best. And what we want to do That's is what we want for every classroom throughout Prince George's County. That's why we're putting the money in here. So we yeah. have the best of the best teaching our children. Right. And, right. And what we want them to do, we, what we want to do is increase the number of national board certified teachers we have, and we want to encourage them with an additional stipend to leave well-performing schools and go to some of our struggling schools and help us uh, there. And so part of that money is for that. And the reason I'm sure that the Teachers Association is going to agree to that part of things is because they're the ones that brought it up in bargaining the last time. So I'm, I'm sure we're on the same page there. We just do have to sign agreements. Can I say, I'm glad they were talking about teachers and about supporting teachers, smaller class sizes, more pay. Our teachers work really, really hard. When I taught, I worked really, really hard. Um, and what we don't do, excuses. When I go talk to teachers, they don't say, well, I wish I, I wish I could make some more money. Every day they wake up, same paycheck, class sizes get big, parents may be less engaged, and they get every morning and they expect a lot from their children. They don't make excuses. They just get up, keep up and get up and do it every day. And they're succeeding. You might have heard we had the largest increase in high school graduation of any district in the state. Largest in the state. And these teachers are working so hard, and they're doing in spite of with less resources. And my board colleagues saying, what would happen if we gave them what they needed? How we could fly. Our ninth grade passage rate went up over four points. Middle school, high school, our teachers work really hard. They're up all night, weekends, spend their own money in some cases, and don't make excuses, and still do well. My question is ask yourself, what could they do if we gave them everything they needed to do it? This question has kind of been asked, but this is a different twist on it. What is being done to bring the public school's performance uh, below state requirements up to standards? This, this whole plan is designed to do that. Uh, the literacy coaches, uh, the gifted teachers, the additional professional development, you know, and there are targets, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, at elementary, you know what, can middle, I, can and I high do this? school. Can I just answer that real quick? So. <laughs> because I was about to get lost. Um, just real quick, in this budget, what I said to Dr. Maxwell when we talked about this budget is just that question. What would it take to take us from 23rd or 24th and move us into the top 10? Not what it will take for me to maintain 23rd or 24th. That's every school everywhere in Prince George's County. Not if you're lucky enough to get into Roosevelt or Oxon Hill or in one of the specialty programs. What would it take? What will it take? So he came back and I said, give me a plan. And this is the plan that's designed by 2020 to take us from where we are to put us in the top 10. So every dime, every category, every program is designed to do exactly that, to take us from where we are at the bottom and to move us in the top. Not a dime more, not a dime less will go to the school system to do that. I said, what will it take? This is to make sure that we have a county. So that's the budget, and that's the proposal that he put up there. So that's how you get to be in the top 10 uh, school system in this state. How can you guarantee, Mr. Baker, how can you guarantee the 15 cents increase will remain with education once your 10 tenure is ended. But Mr. Baker, a couple of times we've had people refer to it as a 15% increase. And we probably need to clarify it's 15 cents it's 15 in the tax cents. rate. That's, that's important. The 15 cents is important because some jurisdictions will pay more. Some jurisdictions will pay less. It's 15 cents on top of that. How can we guarantee that that money will go to, to the school system once I'm gone? That's in 2018. Um, because it's the law. By law, by law, you cannot spend any of that money on anything 
but the education system. They can't move it around to a different category. Can I do that, Terry? Do I have the option on my way out to change it, put it somewhere else? I do not. By law, it must stay there, and it must stay in the school system. So that's the guarantee um, that it will stay in there. It's the law. <clears throat> Why such a high increase? My favorite question. <laughs> Instead of two cents I, or favorite, five cents. I don't even need to read the rest. I know. Okay, okay. Why such a why fifteen cents? It's my favorite question. Why not two cents? Why not? What did I usually? What do we usually give them? Two percent? Two percent raise? Why don't we give them two percent in the school system? And let's see what they can do with that. Because you know what two percent and one percent every administration from the Curry administration to the Johnson administration, to the first four years of the Baker administration, have given them a 2% increase. And that has got us from 24 to 23rd. If we want to move up, what we need to do is to make a dramatic impact. If you go back to the previous question, what I said to Dr. Maxwell was don't tell me how I can be 23rd. I already know that one. If we do nothing, I can guarantee you we'll be either 24 or 23rd. That I can guarantee you. We do nothing. If we give them what we've been giving them, that's what you're going to get. What I said was, how do we move out? How do we move up? So the 15 cents, and why is it 15 cents? Because for the last 30 years, we have not invested at the rate that our competitors did. Even with this, even with this 15 cents, which is about a 21% increase in the school budget, about 21, 21%, sounds like a lot, right? That's $703 million we're gonna be putting into the school system, am I right? I'm sorry? $763 million. Montgomery County, of their own money, their own taxpayers' money, are putting 1.2 billion. 1.2 billion. So even with this increase, we're fighting against our competitors who've been doing it consistently over the years. And you know why we haven't? Because by law, we couldn't. We couldn't. We could only do what the revenues allowed us to. We couldn't increase. So we couldn't do like Montgomery County did last year, where they raised their property taxes and put more in. We can't do what Montgomery County until this year is doing, which is that we're not going to raise our property taxes this year. That's what the county executive said. Because we're going to raise it next year because we want to make sure we're competing against, if you're in Montgomery County, competing against Howard. So the reason the increase is the way it is is because we haven't invested. What that has, what that has proved to us, if we don't invest in a significant way, we will be 23 or 24. Many resources are centered in Upper Marlboro. What steps are being taken to bring educational programs and activities outside of the actual schools to Southern Prince George's? Well, I think Dr. Maxwell can, can speak to it. Let me just start. Part of what we said in this budget, which is why it's 15 cents, was, you know what? I know what I have to do on the general side. I got to make hard decisions with limited resources. That's, that's just life. What they've been doing with that 2% and 1% increase is what they've said is, where is our struggling schools? And that's where we're going to put the resources, which is great. We want to do that. But we also want every part of this 500 square miles to increase. The way we get that, as I said, I want a program, a budget, that targets programs in every single school, not salaries in Upper Marlboro or Sasser in your case. You know, not one school, not, you know, where we need a specialty program, everywhere in here. And so the amount is based on getting those programs to every single school in Prince George's County. That's why the uh, student-based budgeting is so important. That's why we're expanding the academic programs through everywhere. So you see Spanish immersion, not just in the Langley Park area, every, every area, but throughout the county. That's why we're going to have more programs throughout the county. Am I right, Dr. Maxwell? Right. You want to add anything? Only that, you know, again, everything in this plan, you can see on the website, 
everything is going out into schools and to mentor teachers and to salaries and things like that. It's all spelled out in the plan. Uh, what, what the increase is going for, you can go see for yourself. Our homeowners seem to be taking the load on this real estate property tax. What plans do you have to share this load with renters and businesses? Is that a setup question? Somebody from the staff right there? Terry, come on back up. Those of you who don't, ter Terry Charles. Come on up here, Terry. Because that's what the question I asked Terry and uh, Tom Himmler was, you know what, this falls disproportionately on property owners, falls on property owners. As a residential property owner still in Prince George's County, and I have to pay, where's the shared burden of sacrifice? So do renters have to increase? On. Renters will, of course, be subject to the telecommunication tax that's included in your proposal. Mm -hmm. All residents who uh, uh, do, or I should say, all folks who visit our area and stay in our hotels and motels will have an increased bill related to the proposed increase on the hotel motel tax. Right. We also have, as you indicated earlier, uh, our businesses and developers and others will experience higher fees as it relates to securing permits, which permits and fees associated with that. And so that's your apartments, if you so, will. That's right. So everybody, this so is shared. You shared the burden. You, this is shared sacrifice. So if you own an apartment building, you will have seen an increase in your taxes if you own an apartment building. So if you're Southern Management, they're going to get a big bill. If you have an individual business here in the county, you will be subject to, to uh, increase in taxes. Telecommunications tax. This is shared sacrifice because what we didn't want is all of it coming out of residential property taxes. So everybody will share in this because everybody will gain from it. The values of your houses go up, they're worth more. The businesses and the apartments can charge more and have a great place to send their kids to school. Everybody benefits. Businesses have an attractive place um, to expand their business. So we're all going to sacrifice, but we're all going to gain. Thank you. Will Thank our everybody. property taxes be higher than Montgomery County? Terry, will our property taxes be higher in Montgomery County? Yes, they will. Yes, they will. And the reason they will is because the assessed value of properties in Montgomery County are higher than ours. Guess why? Because they have a top school system. So the value of their property is greater, just like Fairfax County, just like Arlington, just like Montgomery, just like Howard County. So yes, but when ours goes up, you can lower it. What property telephone tax increases, I'm sorry, with property and telephone tax increases, would this slow the economy down since property owners will be having less money to spend? That's a good question. Um, I don't believe so, and here's the reason. We are a hot place in this Washington region. As I said in the very beginning, we've got about $6 billion worth of development that's coming. People know, like Gaylord, you know, they're going to get a big bill at Gaylord for the hotel tax. But they're also expanding because of the other things that we're doing in the county. So I think we're going to be able to hold on their economic development. We just got to have that revenue come in. What will help it come in more is having a good school system. If we have a top school system, that helps us sell the county so much better. So this is a question. What is Dr. Maxwell's salary and what additional perks does he enjoy? Does he have a driver, for example? So yes, I, I have a uh, security uh, person for the school system assigned to, to drive me. He drives me most of the time, not all the time, but a significant portion of time. It allows my, my school board and my office to uh, keep me on email and text messages and phone calling instead of driving uh, so they can, they can work me without those few minutes to listen to the radio between this place and that. My base salary, it's all public knowledge. I think my contract is actually on the, the website. 
I make a base salary of $290,000 a year to run a uh, $2 billion organization with over 20,000 employees. Um, it, it, I know that it's a good salary. It's a lot of work, however, I would just add. It's about 60000 well, less than well, why don't we superintendent do this? In since you West didn't, Palm Beach. Since you didn't negotiate your own salary in the school Go board, ahead, did. Curtis. Yes, sir. Can you answer that question for us, please? Well, I, I, think, I think you did a good job, but I think uh, there are two things that went into the negotiation of our school board and the CEO. Uh, one, as you mentioned earlier, is sort of the market rate for the best superintendent we could find. Uh, and the same year we negotiated his salary, he was a finalist for the, for the superintendent of the year in the United States. He was third runner-up in, in, the, in, the, in the country. He was number one in Maryland. He had brought Anne Arundel County uh, tremendously a long way. He was third. So he, he brought Anne Arundel. <laughs> well, uh, Anne Arundel's not really important right now in Prince George's County. So what I'll say is, no, he was superintendent of the, of the year in, in Maryland, third in the country. Uh, so that's, that's on one side. On the other side, he mentioned earlier the size of our, our school system in our district, 17th largest in the country. If our district was anywhere outside of Maryland, we would be 20 school districts. If you go to certain parts of Maryland, Eastern Shore, they may have one, two, three, maybe four high schools, some of them tops. And their superintendent is making $170,000, $180,000 a year to run a school system of seven or eight schools. And so at some point in time, you sort of create these, I'm using a, a, a word, economies of scale, where you think about, OK, at some point in time, you keep adding on schools, we're going to keep doubling and tripling in salary. I actually no. So the larger it gets, he gets more responsibility, but less play commiserate with the number of schools. You know what I mean? So when I think about his responsibility, responding to parents' emails in some instances, not all the time. Um, and sometimes I ride with him because, again, if he's going to go to five schools or six schools in one day, and we are a very large district going from Laurel down to Akakeek, and we want to make sure that when he gets into the building, he is someone who's actually working as soon as he had touches down, that as a school system, as a board, we negotiated his salary, understanding that we have high expectations for him. So someone earlier mentioned how are we going to hold the county the system accountable? I also sit on the CEO evaluation committee. And so when we come next year and we look at sort of, he, he, we're, we're saying, you know, here's your evaluation. Here you want to, you know, you want to read, you want your salary for, uh, you want to go four more years in our system. We're going to look at everything we talked about as, as, as a school board and say, well, you said you were going to do this, Dr. Maxwell. What happened? Why wasn't that done? And over time, we're working with him. But again, he's held accountable by the school board us supporting him to make sure that we're reaching those goals. We had very lofty goals when we brought him in here, um, and we understood that we needed a special person. And I believe he's someone who's a product of our school system, a community college graduate, someone who himself grew up in a single parent home, the only person in his family to graduate from high school, and has a story that people can, that he can identify with parents, students, and everyone throughout the county. And I ask you, when you leave here and we wrap up, talk to the principals here and the teachers and let them tell you about Dr. Maxwell. Don't let me be the one. What do you think of Dr. Maxwell? What do you think, how do you think he's doing? Is he accessible? Does he, is, he, is he fighting for us and for you? What do you think? Education, how important is him? Well, he got three of your kids are teachers? How many, kids, how many of your kids are teachers? <laughs> so, so, we think of, so we think about compensation, we think, okay, well, anybody we brought in here, we, we, could, have, we could have got on a cheap, we could have came in on a cheap and said, you know, we're going we're gonna to pay him what we think we should get, but we wouldn't have got him, and we would have gotten somebody who was maybe the 50th or the 100th on the list, and we'd have, we would have not have gotten where we are right now, which is making tremendous gains in, in culture, which I think is incredibly important in our school system, but also gains um, in our graduation rate. And we're having parents who are moving back in our system because our enrollment's um, moving in the right direction. So for all those reasons, I'm happy to have them. Um, and I, I believe the school board voted unanimously for his contract. Thank you so much. What other budget actions and adjustments are happening to meet the educational need? I think that's you, Doc. So I think it's us. I, I, you know, I know my, my uh, fabulous chief operating officer is here. We, we cut, as we actually developed this budget, we actually cut about $70 million from, from our budget before we began. 
But again, the whole list of everything that, that we've requested is there. I'm not sure if you want to add. Our focus is, is solely on what you see here, the $133 million. We made some changes in our existing budget so that we could focus on the priorities so that we could move ourselves from the bottom to the top. So we made some changes internally. Um, we Every Monday we view um, expenditures at the school level. We're on a, a budget freeze ourselves so that we can monitor expenditures to make sure they go directly into the classroom and not in central office. And, and just to add, Curtis reminded me, we're actually through Betty's shop and through all of our DCOs, we're working with the school system in our Transforming Neighbors Initiative. So we're actually putting social workers in, in school. Betty. Social workers and, and clinical psychologists. And clinical psych psychologists, and we also team with the school system to expand the all-day pre-K that we know is very, um, very good for us. So we did that. Since we're on this topic of salaries, um, it's my understanding that the county executive is due to receive significant raises to his salary oh, over the next five really? years. Really? <laughs> I, I, didn't, I, I don't know who wrote that question. I, I didn't know that, but I'm going to, am I going to get a raise? My, my proposal Terry? is to my proposal is to postpone the increases until the end of his term, three years, to see what accomplishments oh, have yeah. been obtained. <laughs> and, that's a, you know, that's and, a, and there's another question about uh, we, we, you do a pay increase that, for the county executive. Uh, you, you do realize for the county executive, there, there was you know a, a judgment on the county executive and whether in fact he should get more money or get keep the job. It was the election. By law, I can't do anything with the salary. I don't have control of the salary. But if you do know somebody who's giving out raises and stuff, I could use it, because we're about to have a tax increase. I need some help. Um, but no, I don't have anything to do with it. I don't know if I'm getting. And certainly, if you, I think they, there's open form. But by the charter, charter review, for, so for the person who wrote the question, charter review will look at the salaries, and then they can actually Carrie, you want to tell them? Because they want to know where they can go and make sure I'll get them more money or if I don't do anything. But you know what? Here's the unfair part about that question, not to linger it. So I can't run anymore. So, it, you know, in three years, if you hold it, then you could say, oh, you did a pretty good job. We should get an increase, and I don't get none of that. The next person does. That's messed up. <laughs> but anyway, how can they go make sure I don't get no more money? Well, I think what is being and make my wife mad. I believe what is being and referenced my kids. is the outcome from the Charter Commission, mm -hmm. which did make a recommendations that have been approved that re, um, relate to both your salary and the salaries of our council members. And so there is uh, is a, an inflation factor, if you will, that is embedded no. for the next couple of now, years. Now, I can't by law. Can I cut the county executive salary? No. Okay. Here's the deal. I can't cut the county executive salary because it doesn't belong to me. I'm just a renter. It belongs to the citizens, and, the, and they decide what the salary is for the next person coming in there. So whatever it is, um, the Charter Review Committee, I think, do they have public hearings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have public hearings, and you know what? I think, uh, thank you. Okay. So, so um, whoever has this job next, I don't want to make them mad. I, I may need to get a permit or something through. <laughs> we support the innovative thinking to improve education. We understand it comes with a cost attached to it. What can we do to help with supporting this effort? Well, the, the thing you can do is talk to your council members. I mean, there are some ideas that we have. We, we really have listened to people as we've gone around, and some good ideas have come out. Um, one about, you know, we, we originally had it with the council at $60,000 $60, for family would not be affected. So we heard you that that may be too low. We need to go back and look at it, and we are doing that. We heard you about seniors, you know, so we're going to go back and make sure that those seniors um, who are out there are not disproportionately affected by this, who are on fixed incomes. We did hear that, and we're going to look at that. We also looked at, and one of the good things that came out of doing these is a number of our homeowners are not taking advantage of the homestead, homestead tax deduction. If you get the homestead tax deduction, you will not be affected by the increase at all. Um, so one of the things we're going to make sure is that the citizens in Prince George's County who sh should be affected by that are not. We're also looking at ways, you know, listen, nobody wants to pay more taxes. I don't either. I'm dead serious. I don't. 
I do want to have an investment in the biggest property, biggest thing that I own, which is my house. It's a one single investment. It's what I'm leaving my kids, you know, and I want to make sure it goes up in value. So this is an investment in that, but I don't want to pay a dime more than I have to, to make sure that goes up. And so that's why we put it at 15 cents. But we are going to look at a way to say what happens in the future when those revenues do come in from all those projects. How can we make sure that when those revenues come in, that we can actually give people a break? And me, one of them, because I'm a senior citizen. I need it. How do we do that? So we're all looking at ways at that. How you can help us is by calling council members. By calling council members and asking them, okay, let's say we don't do this. Let's say we don't do the increase. The question you should ask them is, how, do you, how can you guarantee that my property value will increase? Let's say we don't do this. How can you guarantee that our school system in the next four years and 10 years won't be 23 or 24? If we don't do this, how can you guarantee that the principal at this great school won't leave because she's done such a terrific job. Charles County came and said, guess what? We're gonna give you a $10,000 signing bonus. So when you call them say, okay, we know what you don't like. You don't like taxes. Guess what? We don't either. But what we all want is investments. So we need you to call the council members and say, okay, you know, that guy Baker's a nut. You know, he's off his rocker. But the conversation is about how we improve the school system. What's your plan? And how do we know that's going to work? Because if they tell you three cents, I can show you where you're going to be. It will be 23. If you allow them to raise your taxes three cents, that's insane. Because that ain't going to move you anywhere. If they say, oh, we're going to give them the same, more, same amount of money we gave them last year, yep, you could do that. You'll be 23 or 24, guaranteed. So we need you to call and engage the council members and ask them. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I have no measure. <laughs> I have no measure. Yeah, we want you to, to ask them. And, if, and the other question is ask them, okay, we believe that the school system deserves more money. We believe we should invest in our children. We know there's got to be some money somewhere. Can you tell us where that money is? And please ask Mr. Baker to put it in the school system. Because I guarantee you, if they give you an answer, say he's got $133 million somewhere hidden, that if they can tell you where it is, I will put it in there. But I think those are the questions we need to ask a council member, because now is a critical time. Thank you. What is the incentive to pay a 15 cents increased property tax rate if my property values will not increase as well? And there are a couple of questions along that line. You know what, what people will tell you when they, you know, I sat down with the realtors, great people, I love them, big supporters of mine. I sat down and they said, you know what, this is going to hurt us selling houses. They say, you know, because the houses are undervalued in Prince George's County. Everybody can tell you, you know, I can tell you, my house is underwater. What they won't tell you is how you get from out of there. They can tell you about the number of foreclosures we have in Prince George's County, and they can say we need to do more. Guess what we are? What they won't tell you is the only way you're going to get the values of your property to go up. There's only two ways. I served in Annapolis. I've served as county executive. I've only found two ways. So if somebody else has got the magic formula, please help me. There's only two ways you raise the value. One is you find funds from somewhere else to supplant you know, what you're putting in there. That means commercial tax base. It means you've got to build a commercial tax base. We're doing that. We're doing everything we can. It takes time, but we're doing it. Aren't we, Terry? We're doing it. The other way is this. You want to stop foreclosures? You want your values to go up? Improve your school system. The only way you can sell houses that are foreclosed and get the money that the banks want for it is to have a great school system. You want to know why we didn't rebound the same way everybody else did, even though they, we were hit the same? It's because you can't sell a house at the same value as you can in Montgomery County, Howard County, Charles County. 
because of their school system. You want the value of your property to go up? Only one way. Have a school system. The only exception to the rule, and it is the exception to the rule, is if you're in DC. Because it's the city. Is that unfair? Hell, heck yes. <laughs> they told me to watch it. Even Baltimore City. You can build downtown because it's the city. Guess what? We're suburbs. I know we got urban areas, but we're the suburbs. The only way we get the value to go up is this. That's the only reason I would do this. There is no incentive for me to do it. As I told people before, when I started this process, I was at 65% approval rating. My mommy was so happy. She was like, honey, you finally got that job, and they love you. All you got to do is just coast. I could cut ribbons from the time I was inaugurated to the time I leave. I can name you the projects. I can just coast. But I'd coast out of here, one, leaving the county worse off in a financial mess, but two, that house that I own, that house that I'm gonna leave my girls, the only way I'm gonna make it worthwhile is by doing this. I improve the school system, the value of the house goes up, and what we leave them is more profitable. That is the only way. There ain't no free lunch. And there ain't no easy answer. Believe me, if there was, I'd go for it. That's what council members won't tell you. That's what businesses won't tell you. That's what the real estate people won't tell you. Can, can I add one thing? One of the conversations that realtors are having with, with, with homeowners, Pritchard this County, great place to buy, nice size houses for cheap, and you, could put your, and you could afford to put your kids in a private school. You all heard that. Great place to live, so cheap, you could afford a private school and still be okay. And the last time, Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Baker, Dr. Baker and I were at, a, uh, were at a forum. Someone said, someone asked him, why not do a tax cut, right? Someone said, why not do a tax cut? They sort of sounded counterintuitive, but I said, I believe there's a cut in this. And he said, what do you mean? We're creating a school system where those who currently have their kid in private school can take them out of private school and put them back in public school. That's a tax cut. That's, That's a, a big cut. tax cut. Some of y'all are paying $15,000 a year for private school. And not going to schools, some of you have not even been in the school that your child is sown for and chose to put your kid in private school based off of, off of rumor. We have parents, some of our Montessori parents, one of my John Hansen Montessori parents is here. Parents to children of Spanish immersion are here. There's, we're trying to, we're creating a system. We're not trying, we're creating a system that says take your kids out of private school, put that 15 grand back in your pocket, and invest in your, in your community because the school system is that good. Because realtors are saying, come by here, it's so cheap you could put your kid in private school. And we're saying, no, come by here and keep that private school money in your pocket. To me, that's a cut. That's to me. Thank you. What contribution are companies like Walmart, MGM, the Peterson Company's making, or are we making no requirements just to get these companies to come or to expand into Prince George's County? And we have a couple of questions on, along that line. No, every company that comes in here is required to pay. In fact, we just put a additional tax on the Gaylord. So they'll have one of the highest rates in this area. I think with the, tel with the hotel tax, They'll be, hit, they'll be hit harder. So everybody who's coming here is paying. Um, businesses are included in this, and we're, in, we're increasing the fees at our uh, Department of Permits, Inspection, and Enforcement, which is where they get their permits to draw this. So um, this is shared sacrifice. Could I, could I just add, that's the tax side of things, but I know I was at a, a church with folks from the, the Peterson Foundation uh, not far from here, they're giving a million meals uh, to needy families in Prince George's County. Uh, they're doing some other work with our with our schools, and and uh, they did uh, some um, some laptops and things for Oxon Hill High School. I think last year. I mean, they are making some contributions beyond the the taxes. Just for the record. So so is MGM. I'm sorry. Up to friendly as well, but I also say particularly with Oxon Hill High School, uh, we are partnering with Gaylord on, on our culinary arts. Uh, program at Oxon Hill High School that will give students opportunity to actually work in Gaylord. Also, they're partnering with the community college where we have a lot of our dual enrollment students 
Uh, they have a culinary arts um, hospitality management uh, program at the community college where current students who are either dual enrolled or through the health sciences can actually go. So I think there's responsibility. I live on the other side of the fence from the Gaylord. Literally, I live in Riverbend. I'm a president of my civic association. So I understand this quite clearly, the relationship between us and the, and the National Harbor. But we are coming to these, these groups, asking them to become very good, good citizens, particularly with making sure that our students our career, we're making sure they're career ready. We want to make sure they give us, they give them a job once right. we graduate them. Yeah, that's an that's an important point that uh, Curtis said. On each one of these, we're making a requirement that um, they hire our children who are qualified are coming out there in Prince George's County residents, which is no small thing. So we are doing that in addition to uh, raising their uh, raising their rates. So we have about thirteen more questions to go. It's 10 minutes past nine, so I just wanted to let everyone know that. And we're going to answer every single question. Why can't students go to any school in a certain area? For example, Oxon Hill instead of Crossland. I'd, I'd say that, you know, that usually you see that happen in urban areas that have, you know, the buses and the metro like, like DC and Baltimore does. You know, we, are, we provide, provide transportation to our kids, and to have them be able to go to any school that they want to go would increase patient costs tremendously. So that's why we have zone schools. We do have some magnet runs and things, but to just have open enrollment to any school, um, you know, it's just, just uh, you know, too much additional money in the transportation budget. What happened to the money from the AAA bond rating over $200 million? That is the rainy day fund. I don't know who asked that question, but thank you for asking. We use that money to, one, spur businesses to come here, but more importantly, every time we propose that we do tight belt tightening um, in the county, it was come back to us so we didn't have to furlough people the first year because we have a $75 million deficit my first year I inherited. So we use rainy day fund or one-time funds from that for that to keep from the furloughs and the layoffs. The second year we had a $115 million deficit. Uh, we used the money to keep from doing that, but we also used the money for police and we gave the school additional money so they could expand the all day uh, pre-K program. And last year we had $130 million deficit, $130 million deficit. So I've had a deficit every year. Every year they keep promising me it's gonna get better and it goes up. But we've used the reserve fund to the point now our AAA bond rating is in jeopardy. That's why this year we said, you know what? We've done every, used every ounce of dollars we had hidden. All that money that was hidden under the, under the mattress, guess what? We spent it last year. Council said, well, where's that money? You know the, the, the orange money. You know that commercial, the orange, where's the orange money? Well, y'all spent the orange money last year. So we wouldn't have to make tough decisions. There's no more orange money. We can't draw down on the rainy day fund. There's none left. So what it means on our side, not on their side, because this, whether this tax increase goes forward or doesn't, won't help us with the fact that we don't have any more orange money. That's why we're proposing that we have to start cutting. And now we're to the point where you just can't cut vacant positions you got to cut actual live people, 110 actually live persons who pay mortgages and who need their jobs. That's why we're going to furlough people, which I'm agreeing to be furloughed along with them. Although now that I know I ain't going to get a pay raise, I might have to rethink that one and talk to my family. Um, but no, there is no more options left for us. So we have, there's no money that we can take from the reserve and put it over here. So is this a one-time tax increase, or will you come back in three to five years with another tax increase? Well, one, it won't be me in three or five years. I can guarantee you that. Um, no, this is it. You know, this is our shot. Because quite honestly, if we don't invest now, if the next person who's county executive is brave enough to go through this process, and they come to you and they say, I want to raise it by 15 cents, you should not do it. 
Because in four years or three years, when I leave this office, they come back and say, I want to raise it by 15 cents. It's not enough to move you. Don't do it. I wouldn't vote for it. Because right now is our window of opportunity to take 15 cents and to raise us where we need to be to be competitive. So I can guarantee you, as much as I can guarantee you, that no other county executive will go through this process that I've gone through. And if I didn't believe so strongly in the fact, for a selfish reason, that I want my property values to go up, and I want our schools and our kids to be competitive, I certainly wouldn't put you through it. But I, I can guarantee you nobody, at least in the next three years, this is it, this is our shot. You know, it's, as I told Dr. Maxwell, I said, this is the moonshot. This is it. These are the resources. You need to make it work. And you need to see some progress. Because we're all on the line on this one. Although this is the fourth information session I've attended, this is the first time I heard about full-day four-year-old preschool. Will that program begin in every elementary school throughout the county? Uh, the, the short answer to that is no. We're, we're uh, proposing 67 uh, new uh, all-day pre-K over the next uh, three years. I'm surprised to hear somebody say they haven't heard that in, in, in three of the other ones. I mean, I, I could see missing it once maybe, but it's a big, big part of this plan. We've been doing uh, additional all-day pre-K, you know, for the last two years. Um, I think the, the first ones started almost exactly the day that, that I started, I think, and then we've continued to expand, and this will roll it out to a bunch more. So there's, there's a couple of, uh, you know, we talked about the capital money earlier. We have parts of our county where we have no room at all in elementary schools, particularly in the northern part of our county, in the Laurel area, for example. Uh, every classroom is already used, and we've put as many portables at those schools as we can. So in our capital uh, plan, we, we have a proposal to build two new middle schools over the next number of years so that we can take the sixth grades out of the elementary schools, move them uh, into the middle schools, and then be able to put pre-kindergartens there. But we absolutely, in some parts of our county, we have absolutely no room to do pre-K. But this does, again, put 67 more. It'll bring us close to 100, I think, uh, by the time we finish that rollout. There seems to be little in the plan for high schools. No, that, that's, that's not true. And again, you, you know, I know Monica can, can speak to all the details, but it actually rolls out the rest of the high school academy uh, programs that we had uh, planned for them. It expands um, the uh, literacy coaches, as I said, in all of the high schools. It also uh, works on breakfast in high schools as well. And the professional development, the teacher expands, the expanded art and foreign languages, both secondary and uh, uh, primary grades, elementary schools. Monica, do you want to add? I just want to say high school is addressed in every area with the exception of expanded, gifted, and ta talented, and universal pre-K. And um, you've talked about the graduation rate, but the flip side of that is um, what about addressing high school dropout rates and suspension rates? So, so the graduation rate and the dropout rate are related to one another, not one-to-one not -one, because you have kids who move, you know, you have families that for business reasons or military reasons or whatever, they, they get transferred, for example. But the higher your graduation rate in almost every district, uh, then the lower your dropout rate. Again, it's not a one-to-one -one guarantee, but by increasing the graduation rate, we'll be decreasing the dropout rate. The other part of that question was... Drop out suspension. Oh, rates. suspensions. So, so Maryland is one of the earlier states to rewrite the state requirements, and all of the districts have been rewriting their local requirements. And we've been working, partnering with our teacher association as well on, on a um, on a uh, justice uh, uh, system for making sure that we're not being overly punitive with kids. We're moving away, as all districts across the country are starting to do, from those zero tolerance things. Although, you know, violence and and serious. There's absolutely no question with what many of us call the soft suspensions, things like disrespect. What's disrespectful? What you feel like is disrespectful to you is dis not disrespectful to me or vice versa. And so we're, we're scrutinizing those things very, very carefully and looking at alternatives, uh, quite frankly, to, to how we uh, deal with kids. We don't want kids who are you know, just running amok in our schools and, and out of control and those kind of things. But at the same time, you know, I've had, I talked to a parent just last night 
uh, who, who was saying that her child had been in an, in, a, in an AP exam and had taken her ID off during the exam and put it in her pocket and walked out in the hallway without her ID on and, and, and got told she had lunch detention, you know? And to me, you know, I don't know the rest of the details. I'll, I'll have to figure that out. Seems a little overreactive to me to not allow a kid to take their ID out of their pocket and put it on. But, um, but I think, you know, we have to be reasonable in the way we deal with kids. But on the other hand, you know, we can't let some of the craziness that we all know happens go on. Why has this, the school system still not applied for E-rate, FCC tech funding? Dr. Golson. We have applied for E-rate and we get funds each year for E-rate. Um, it's several million dollars and we just applied for this year's E-rate. Um, it went in last, I wanna say two or three weeks ago. So we have, we've applied for it for the past three to four years. What's being done to reach out to the community, including seniors, adults, without children, and retirees, to volunteer at their local schools? I, I would say just firstly, uh, the increase in those community outreach advisors would be people who would be doing that, be building those partnerships with those who are interested in volunteering. Those of you, those who want to volunteer is a process. You have to go through a criminal background check, things like that. So helping to facilitate that process, knowing where to go to get it, all the documentation it takes to become a member of our school and make sure that they're getting in and uh, have their ID and all those things. So as we're increasing uh, 60 new community outreach advisors, again, people who, uh, most of whom are bilingual, are really reaching out, reaching out to communities uh, that have not been previously involved in our school system. Uh, but I will take the time right now to say, for those of you who have not been in our schools or have not been in our schools in a very long time, I please recommend go to a school, go to a school, ask to be with the principal, even, even if you have a child, don't have a child in the school. Talk about what's happening in the school so that when people ask you in your community, I hear Prince George's County schools are not doing well. You say, hold up, no, no, no. And actually, I was over at the school yesterday. There are great things happening over there. We have to be the, we have to be the voice for our school system. And people come to me and say, Curtis, yeah, I, I hear our schools suck. I beg your pardon, which school are you talking about? Well, I heard about it in the barbershop. Which school are you talking about? The whole thing. <laughs> so, and, I, and I, just really quickly, they told me to be short, but I'll just say one story. When I was a kid, my mom moved into a community, and she heard that the schools were really bad and put me in a private school the first year. Didn't go to the school, just heard about it. All the kids in my community were going to a private school. She put me in a private school. The next year, it got a little too expensive. She called the principal and says, I hear your school suck. To the principal. The principal was dumbfounded. I don't, what are you talking about? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know that that's a rumor, but give me one year with Curtis and my sister Nicole. Give, give me one year to beat back all the rumors you heard about what was happening in our school system. 10 years, 11 years later, both my sister and I graduated from that school system. She's a lawyer, and I have a master's degree from Harvard. We believe in public education, but we have to be the champion. We can't just use rumors and innuendo about what's happening in our schools. We have to get in and see for ourselves the great things that are happening. We have to be the voice and beat back, because Prince George's County is where it's at, and no one else is going to come defend our system but us. No one's going to defend it but us. So I ask that you to go in our system so that you can be speaking intelligently about what's happening in our schools and defend the fact that our schools are not moving in the right direction. Because I, I push back and I believe we're moving in the right direction. Are all of the schools in the county required to inform parents about the Common Core standards that the state adopted? If so, what is or was the timeline for the schools to do so? And what is being done about the fact that some schools have not yet held an official meeting for parents and students about Common Core? So the response is yes, all schools sh um, should have informed parents by now. We are in the second administration of the park exam. Students have taken them twice now. So your child or student should have come home and, and converse with you about the actual receiving delivery and instruction. So if you want to see me afterwards, I can definitely make sure that um, the principal contacts you directly to share what was shared with your community. But it should have been done long before now. And I, and I also think you know it's important to know that MSDE had regional meetings around the state and I'm thinking that they were at Flowers, 
they were at Flowers. We had a Common Core meeting last school year um, from the state, and it was at Charles Herbert Flowers. Charles and Herbert it was Flowers, and it was a regional uh, meeting. They had some over on the Eastern Shore, Western Maryland, Central Maryland, Southern Maryland. And so, again, they came around and, and were in schools all across the state. The Common Core started a long time ago, and the implementation, the state adopted the standards years ago, had to have legislation to do it. And then, as I said earlier, each, di each local district, like Prince George's County, has to write our standards to the state standards. And so, you know, this is really a, an, I mean, there's a lot of talk going on about right now, but it's really been implemented for years. Prince George's County has the second highest property taxes in the state. Is the money needed due to mismanagement of funds? With a triple A bond rating. <laughs> uh, no, the money that we, we send over to the school system, that's why we made sure that the amount of money that's going there, all $133 million, is to go toward these categories right here. Um, so none of that money if, uh, will go into the general side, which I can control, and uh, all of the money will go to the uh, school system. Thank you. If you have an employee who lives in Prince George's County, how can they pay the tax increase if they're being furloughed or laid off? Great question, because um, if they are being furloughed or laid off, then they probably will fall under one of the categories that we have there. We have a, you know, hardship cases we're looking at. I think that's why we're looking at expanding the amount of uh, where the deduction goes. And so we'll take it a case by case basis. What is the county doing to help fix the root of our black community's problem when it comes to education of social values, which is parenting and fatherless households? What we're doing in this budget is why we put the money in, I think, our community um, outreach efforts. In addition, um, as we mentioned before, in Betty's shop, where we have our health and human services, our family services, social services, all working integrated with our school system and our parents. We also have our public safety working with our school system and our parents, because we know it's a whole community. That is also why we've taken the limited resources we have in the county to target those areas where we see where the highest, highest uh, needs are. Um, and not just school dropouts or promotion rates, but also lack of job opportunities, lack of uh, uh, transportation, um, lack of economic development, and we've targeted those areas, and we're starting to see us move in the right direction. But the key component of it, the big key to it, is our education system, and that's why these fundings will help. Thanks, Betty. We have had parent liaisons before charged with the same responsibilities as those articulated by Curtis Valentine. The issue is that at the very moment we make positive strides forward, at the first sign of budget issues at the county or state, the school system suffers. And with the number of at-risk students currently third in the state, maintenance of effort will not impact this population. Please address. That's why we're doing the 15 cents so we don't have to make those hard choices where some schools, like I was saying, I was in Oakland Elementary School, they had a great parent resource person there. But the teacher used her money to, you know, use a crude term, buy a parent resource person. Another teacher couldn't use her money to do that because she had to deal with other issues. We want to make sure no one has to make that type of a choice. That's why we're putting the money uh, that we are in, are in there. And then as, as a school board, this is something that we, we really advocated for as, as board members to make sure that those, those positions are, are increased. My committee, Parent, Family, and Community Engagement Committee really pushed those, those, uh, those positions. And they pay for themselves. In many cases, they're going out building partnerships with local businesses, and they're donating to the schools money that would not have previously been there if those advisors were not there. So ladies and gentlemen, this is our final comment. Yesterday, I attended the Dream Academy panel discussion at the Rayburn office building in, in Congress. The topic was parental engagement for high-performing students. Has the county considered any campaigns to really push 
parental engagement as a critical factor in the success of our schools. For example, my son attends the French Immersion Program. There, a requirement that parents sign off on increased involvement as a requirement for your child's optimum uh, performance. It's clear if this is the program for you, you're going to have to commit to an increased level of play in your game. Can I just say a couple of things uh, in that? Number one, our French Immersion Program is a blue ribbon, was a, a national blue ribbon, one of the few schools in the country that actually gets certified by the emb an embassy uh, for our French uh, students. Uh, when I'll say a parental engagement again, uh, something that I, I, it's very personal to me, particularly uh, fatherhood, uh, I created something called uh, the Fatherhood Forum, uh, PGCPS Fathers, if any of you are all on Twitter. Uh, this is an opportunity for men, for fathers in particular, to get more involved in our school system. <clears throat> the data is clear. When fathers are engaged, graduation rate goes up, students who get in special education go down, discipline improves. Everything works better when fathers are more involved in our school system. We're seeing fathers step up all around the county. I was at a father-daughter dance at Valley View. We're having you know, donuts with dads. Fathers are stepping up. The parental engagement, particularly with some of the young men that people talk about, are, are students that are actually struggling the most, are young, are young men of color. We need men stepping up, whether you have a son in the system or not. That's really going to make the difference. Us stepping up saying, when I see a young person walking down the street, I see him not doing something. The previous generation, you all used to talk to us. Y'all weren't afraid to tell us that we weren't doing something right. That's how I grew up. That's how I got here. Because young men, every once in a while, they were sort of pushing me in the right direction. With our system, we believe that there's, there's resources that need to go to our schools, but it's something that money just can't buy. Parents staying engaged, men stepping up, particularly with our young men, parents following what's happening with their children, particularly on our school max program. We have a, a map in your pocket. You can find out whether your child went to school that day, what grades they have. We have teachers staying up all night making sure the grades are in the system, but some parents aren't even checking it. This time last year, I got a phone call from a parent said, my daughter might not graduate, uh, she has a D in the class, can you fix this? The first thing I said to him was, is her grade different than the grade you've been tracking all school max all year? And he got real quiet. He didn't know what that was, he hadn't been tracking. And at the, final, at the final minute, he wanted me to go around the principal and the teacher and undermine all of them because he had not taken his own responsibility. I would love to stand in front of you and say, you know what, no matter what happens, I'm gonna come defend you no matter what you do. Curtis Valentine, that's not your man. <laughs> we have a system that we're creating. 130,000 students. It only works if we're all involved. We are stepping up. All three of us are fathers in the system. County Executive Baker had three children go through Prince George's County Public Schools. He understands what that means to be an engaged parent. It's up to us to take up the responsibility and make sure that we are setting example for our children. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the formal part of our program, but before we leave, I would be remiss if I didn't explain to you that County Executive Baker decided that he wanted to address our residents personally. And he told us that later we started these programs, I'm exaggerating. But County Executive Baker cleared his calendar, Dr. Maxwell cleared his calendar, Curtis Valentine and the chair of the board, Segun Eubanks, cleared their calendars. But there was staff in Prince George's County government and on the school system side that jumped into action and made this happen. And this was all over <laughs> Prince George's County. We went from one end of the county to the other. And I want to specifically recognize Barry Hudson, Tahani Colazzo, Jackie Woody, Loretta Tillery, Jenny Nevin. Um, there's so many people. Natalie, Nathaniel Tut, oh, uh, Tangie Allen, and many others that I've, uh, Linda Turner, did I mention Linda? So many others. Oh, Amber, everybody jumped into action to make sure that we got out here because the county executive wanted to talk to his residents. And I thank you so much for coming out this evening. This was the largest group we've had, and you've been very attentive. Thank you so much.